presentation is part of a research project uh, that I'm part of the team, um, which is a project about witchcraft and images of uh, witches in cinema, visual arts, theater. So uh, this is just a little part of it. I will try to interrogate the role that pictorialism played in early and then in silent cinema as we know it, in the sense of approaching a narrative strategy instead of just being descriptive, and I will just develop on that. First, I would just like to uh, note the fact that when uh, the subject of supernatural entities uh, be began to appear in films, although it's not quite films at that time, uh, it was a different type of uh, typology that we we can find. For example, in uh, Georges Méliès' film Le Sorcier, Le Prince et Le Bon Génie, we had a male character, so it wasn't like really scary. Or uh, it was more um, a way in which he could enact all his stages and tricks. So uh, we had this film going back to 1900, but it wasn't really what we could call a scary film. It wasn't we. Obviously, we couldn't talk about horror genre at that time. And then, by the time the American industry moved from the uh, southern parts to the Californian state, and uh, it had moved on to a, a more complex production, by 1908, we had a film called The Witch, which had a female character. Uh, and then, uh, Heather Green uh, counted 28 witch films, out of which only, of course, just five have survived. But I was just trying to, to point out the, the growth of the subject in silent cinema. As a side note, it's interesting that they did not contain witchcraft per se. Those women in films did not uh, have any magical uh, rituals going on. For example, a silent film using a witch would be um, a character who disobeyed her husband and befriended an Indian woman. So a woman who did not accept to marry the village bully. So there were actually young women who were challenging the social norms. So that was witchcraft at the time. But this is just a side note. What I'm trying to demonstrate in this short selection I is that uh, theorists have argued whether or not we can speak about these films as being horror, horror the horror genre. And uh, some of them consider only Dracula and Frankenstein, the films made by Universal Studios in the 30s, as being the first horror films. Others would say that, okay, well, then where do we about fear as being the aim and scope of these films, even though at the time they were not considered in that way, but they had this element of fear going on, uh, they could be uh, considered horror films and could be analyzed as such. So these are just various perspectives on something that is still debatable. But in my own research, I would consider that any film that had as a subject like uh, nightmarish situations or uh, frightful entities, supernatural entities, would be in this category. Um, my notion that I want to debate in relation to early and silent cinema is pictorialism, which is also a notion very debated at the same time, in a sense that uh, depending on the object of study, it, it kind of develops into an own version of what it means. Of course, we have uh, Brent Brewster's and Leah Jacobs' um, interpretation, and in a very general perspective, they say that in the beginning, early cinema strived to be theatrical. It did not have the possibility to emerge from theater, and it had uh, all these theatrical settings, and actors would uh, display this large uh, theatrical um, mimics and gesture poses and attitudes, so it would be only to um, only seen as an appeal to the audience's visual pleasure, not necessarily ent integrated into the narrative. Now, more recent approaches to this notion of pictorialism, like that of Jarmo Valcola, um, move a little bit the notion towards narrativity and the, f the way in which it, in it interacts with narration in film. And uh, it's it kind of suggests that in Valcola's, um, in Valcola's approach, uh, pictorial qualities on, on, of narration uh, kind of perform through association and connotations on the level of spectator's imagination, including the mental aspect of approaching narration. What I'm trying to say in, in more simple terms is that in the beginning of um, researching pictorialism, uh, it would be seen as a concept operating in this relationship with theater, and nowadays in recent research is it's most, it challenges the idea of narrativity and the way it actually performs and performed from early, uh, from early cinema 
until today. And I, I will go into more specific uh, details with two films that I'm, I try to, uh, to study. Uh, the first would be a very recently discovered and restored version of Frankenstein, the 1910 film of J. Cyril Dolly. Now, uh, what is interesting here is that in the, the booklet that um, uh, was um, described, Edison would, um, would say that in order not to shock audiences, they kind of cleared all the elements from the story that they thought they that might have a strong impact on audiences. And in fact, and I'm quoting, we concentrated the mystique and psychological problems uh, that are found in this tale. So we departed from the original story in the idea of eliminating what would be repulsive to a moving picture audience. Uh, so we have this notion of uh, an audience reaction to something that is fiction. So we have a, a literary source well known and still, the producers would think that some of the aspects would be controversial and the reaction would be very strong. Uh, pictorialism comes uh, in this um, demonstration as more of the elements they did consider to include in the film. Um, so I just remind you that they said, we did not include anything that would scare you. We, we kind of approached the psychological version of Frankenstein. And in fact, even if this monster in the image would not scare anybody, they had this image and it was quite an, an interesting uh, approach to uh, how to create the birth of Frankenstein on film. They had a dummy set on fire and uh, reversed the footage. So it actually seemed as Frankenstein would be born out of nothing. So in spite of what Edison would say at the time, it was this um, very pictorial, kind of composition in all senses, even in the sense of how the story would relate to how, how uh, cinematically Frankenstein would be born on screen. They had this very interesting approach with which, uh, unfortunately, we do not have um, uh, testimonies on how people reacted to this, but I'm sure it, would, it seemed just as innovative as it seems today for a 1910 film. Here, pictorialism works in the sense of what Ben Brewster and Leo Jacobs have described it, with theatrical settings, with um, this, um, up, uh, this uh, sided wall that it was not broken, you were uh, as, as in front of a stage. Uh, the actors will, were not uh, broken, the 180 degrees uh, rule. And uh, everything was just from minor details to the setting and mise-en-scene, uh, set design, uh, the moving of the actors in the shot, it was very theatrical in very um, arch archaic somehow way. But at the same time, we had this uh, innovation in how to create a monster on screen. Um, and just a, a quick um, note, we have this um, very, staged um, position of the body instead he could have had his hands just around his body but he has this very theatrical openness like you had on stage when actors had to be very to move around to be seen even from the back of the room we didn't have this problem on cinema but we they kind of kept it so this is the strange pictorialism that cinema was trying at the same time to um, to copy from theater and then, and at the same time to emerge as a new art form uh, I will just make a leap to 1922 in, on a very short, a very, very, very well known, excuse me, uh, film, Haksan, Witchcraft Through the Ages, which was for a very long time considered inappropriate, as you probably know, to be shown in theaters, in the fact that in, 1990, in 1922, a variety, uh, the Variety reporter wrote that it is as wonderful as this picture is, it is absolutely unfit for public exhibition. And it was for many decades. But what is more interesting is that by 1994, so lots of decades later, um, a British film critic um, writing, writing for The Guardian to, uh, wrote that it was a delirious mix of historical tableau and lantern lecture, but otherwise it's just a hobble and bubble of Bosch demons. So it was still, um, cited, um, somehow excluded from the canonical films in the way, okay, it experiments with uh, staging a lot of controversial scenes. We have Satan, which is um, um, exor exorcisms, an orgy 
uh, so all types of uh, very taboo uh, scenes that were integrated in this film, but um, it's just for an attractive quality and attractive even in the way that you mentioned before on Tom Gunning's cinema of attraction as an attraction and not not much more. Um, but I would argue that here pictorialism really uh, steps up in the sense that it can be approached as a narrative component of the film. Um, more precisely in these types of um, frame designs of mise-en-scene in which we have the theatrical tradition of even in the, uh, in the image on my, my right, on your, on the, on your left, um, we have the lighting that uh, um, shapes the silhouettes that we can see just in theatre as, as a theatrical effect. But at the same time, uh, the same effect uh, of lightning in the second shot, in which we have this group of characters with the, dam the demon and uh, all the witches, and we have a witch on the right of the image and one bandit, um, in which pictorialism becomes um, like a vehicle for, uh, for developing the story. It's not just descriptive in the sense of, yes, I staged the image and the composition, the mise en scène, as in theater, but I can tell you the story through the, fa through the way in which I selected the elements. And just to be more concrete, this is based on um, a terminology proposed, pr you probably um, know it as it affected both literary and filmic uh, fields, uh, by André Godreau, who speaks of a very, di very important difference between literary texts, staged uh, performances and cinema. And he speaks of the so-called filmic narrator monstrator, which I think is a very good example of how it works in this film. In other, uh, in other words, uh, he speaks of a double agent when we have a film in the fact that the mise-en-scene or the set design monstrates shows something through pictorialism, obviously, most of the times. And then at the same time, it narrates uh, with the diegetic common elements that we have in a story. So I think this is the, um, in this film you can argue that Tom uh, Andre Godreau's uh, terminology is very precise in the way in which it can be approached um, and it, ca it can be applied, sorry, in, in, in this uh, case study. We have these elements who bear narrative knowledge at the same time being very descriptive of the medium of the story, the diegetic world. So we have these two, um, these two uh, roles functioning as a, some, some kind of, of a mega author, as he sometimes, Andre Godreau calls it. Uh, I think I was a little bit too concise. <laughs> I was trying not to go overboard with the time. So um, to conclude, um, I think looking in retrospective, we can see, especially early cinema, but also uh, silent cinema, in what uh, at, at later had in what uh, it later became, uh, as uh, a multitude of case studies that can validate Andre Godreau's uh, research on this mega author, in this narrator monstrator at the same time, from this new perspective that integrates pictorialism as a narrative tool. Now, I'm a little bit reserved to use it as a narrative tool, but at, but at least to see it, as I put it in the title, as a narrative strategy. I'm not sure we can speak to, to the extent of quite a narrative component. But as a narrative strategy, we can see mise-en-scene, uh, set design, frame shots, and uh, even movements of actors and their, um, um, their um, uh, gestures as carrying uh, narrative content. This is like, would be overall my, my conclusion. So, thank you.